Yo, what's good? It's Mastermind MMA, and you're tuned into the Mastermind MMA podcast. This is episode 12, like the number of months of John Jones' last USADA sentence. 12, like the number of months it's been longer than since Conor McGregor's fucking defended a belt. And 12, like the number of title defenses I don't think Mighty Mouse will get to if he fights TJ. And speaking of that, let's get right on motherfucking into it. It is the super fight era, straight up. And I'm not trying to like toot my own horn or any shit like that, but if you go back to my uploads and go back like a little bit, not too long ago, but like on like November 4th or some shit like that, I did a video when they dropped the UFC 3 trailer. And I pointed out, I even put it in in the headline for the video. I said, Miocic versus Cormier in the works with a question mark. And the reason I said that was because in the video, they had uh, like a cut scene of DC and, and Stipe facing off at a weigh-in. And I thought that was very interesting because it, it kind of seemed that the, the rollout they're doing for UFC 3 was integrated with their future plans. And it was like they're dropping Easter eggs. And I said maybe they're maybe they're dropping an Easter egg for it. And I gave my thoughts on what I what I thought about if they made the fight then. And lo and behold, after after Stipe dismantled Nganu pretty much and just found a hole and just ripped that shit wide open. Like it's like if you have like a, a, a old t shirt and it has like a tiny hole, bro. It could be like a fucking, like, a pin mark, and all someone has to do is just rip that open little, and they could just rip that whole entire fucking t-shirt in half, and that's basically what Stipe did to Nganu, and the way he did it, and and, and I'm also going to cover 220, and the way he he did it, it was, was very systematic and very... Pretty much what everyone said he had to do to win is what they game planned and executed, and they did pretty perfect. And now, even after that, Dana was kind of angling for it, and then DC's like, I don't know, you know, you got Kane, and we all know Kane is the reason DC came down to light heavyweight. And uh, at heavyweight, DC was looking real good. You know, you look at his Bigfoot fight. He was looking nice in that Bigfoot fight, and I'm not going to lie, it's kind of looking like DC's kind of returning back to form. The The Vulcan Uzdemir fight was very telling, because how DC would, would go out and perform on that fight before it happened would, would say a lot, because in the interim of John Jones being gone, and the opponents DC faced... They, they were a high caliber, and he, he did bring it at the Gus fight. And now with um <clears throat> with the fights he had with fucking um, Rumble and Silva, you know, that was what was standing out before. But now you kind of, you look back and you kind of think, all right, you have his Gus fight. You have both his John Jones fights. And then now you have this Uzdemir fight. And granted, he got knocked out in his last fight before, but he was looking like the best DC we've seen before he, <clears throat> excuse me, before he essentially got caught. And and the fact that he came and he was willing to stand and trade and he didn't look tentative. He didn't look like he didn't look like it didn't look like that knockout really changed him. You know what I mean? It looked like what he was talking and speaking about in interviews was true to form because he was like, you know, I had to deal with that. I got over it. Now I'm looking to just kind of shake this off. And he wasn't looking to shake it off in the sense of, I just want a W in my column. He was looking to essentially prove to himself that he's still an extremely, like he could compete at a very high level. And I feel like I feel like Vulcan proved a lot in that fight as well. But, you know, granted, the stoppage was a little it was Vulcan was stuck. And granted that it was kind of pitter patter shots that added up. But, you know, he wasn't doing anything to get out of it. And then it would have been that. So, you know, essentially you put the referee in a situation where you give him no other no other go, you know, and. 
you got to give credit to DC for for being able to get that control and establish that dominance. You know what I mean? Especially after going out there and standing and trading. So it, it was pretty efficient. He went out there and he, he, he looked to prove a point to himself, to himself and to everybody else. And he did it. And then he kind of just wrapped it up. So, you know, especially at that end when he locked in that rear naked choke, it was like, all right, I could, I could end this at pretty much whatever point I want on the ground. And essentially that proved to be true. And, you know, I don't think that's saying anything against Vulcan too much because Vulcan is he, he, he proved to be high level. And then you can't take away how high level DC is. And I know I've shat on DC a lot in the past, but I was always vocal of my reasons of doing it at the time. And a lot of the driving factors of it was his performances at that time. You know, I'm not going to just shit on him for no reason, especially when he's coming out and he, he's pretty much doing his damn thing. So I'm like, all right, I could rock with that. I could I could get behind that. And, you know, with Stipe and DC being announced and worked out and with it being hosted on tough and then you have the rumors of a card being uh, that that July 7th card being DC Stipe fucking cyborg nunez and tj dj that's like yo that is some that's some shit and i'm about it you know this is handling super fights the right way because when when dc was on the mma hour he kind of made a good point like a lot of those divisions don't have a clear-cut contender when you look at heavyweight who's really there although verdum is my guy I, i i really feel like after this is cleared up, I want to see Verdum in the t- in the heavyweight picture. You know, the title picture. Um, I-, I feel like, you know, heavyweight, there's not really, besides Verdum, there's not really anyone too clear. Light heavyweight, most definitely there's no one too ready right now. Especially Gus that he's out. And, um, you know, bantamweight, you know, you kind of got to let... Maybe have, I would love to see Dom and Cody rematch. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that later because that, that may come to fruition. And, you know, Jimmy is kind of sitting on it. Jimmy Rivera, that is. He is kind of sitting on his ass at this point. And, um, you know, flyweight, most definitely not. And there you go. And featherweight, there is no other, there is no one else in the featherweight division and who's up in women's bantamweight. So that's really using you in, instead of throwing some bullshit like how would they, how they would handle the flyweight division where where they would just give all right DJ you're fighting this 11 ranked guy because you cleared number 1 through 10 out. So they're being smart about it and they're doing champion versus champion fights we want to see. <clears throat> And when you look at the UC and you look at how how different it is, and I, I also wanted to bring a, a point to this is fucking awesome, and I'm all about the super fights, and I'm all about the champion versus champion. And when you look at how they're operating now, and how they did in the past, and how rare those champion versus champion fights were, and when you look at the golden era, like the when you had the reigning champions there's a press conference that they had where it was everyone at their like dominant time they had like fucking they didn't even have the flyweight division yet so you had dominic cruz and then i think it was no yeah you had dom cruz you had jose aldo and then i think it was frankie edgar at the time or pettit i can't remember who was the lightweight champion i think it was frankie um And then you had GSP, Anderson Silva, John Jones, and Cain Velasquez. And that was, like, almost the time where, like, we're like, oh, shit, we're seeing, like, the greatest talent we've seen up at this point. And most of those people are very relevant till, till this day and to this point. But the thing is, when you had GSP streaking GOAT conversation, you had Silva streaking it. Anderson definitely was in the GOAT conversation. So that was the one we wanted to see. And, you know, it, it's kind of not for lack of trying, but because there's time, because they did offer it 
GSP the Anderson Silva fight. And they offered him the Anderson Silva fight after the Hendricks fight. So, you know, that was probably not going to call him out or draw him out. So, you know, that that's just kind of a point I want to make how they could have capitalized in the past. But the fact that they're doing it now is fucking awesome. And the way they're doing it is strategic and smart. But it's almost like they kind of said, fuck it. In the sense of we're we're gonna to to draw like a metaphor in a financial sense, they're like, all right, we're not gonna save up and you know think long term. We're just gonna kind of operate in a way we're living paycheck to paycheck. So it's like they're doing they're going from pay per view to pay per view. They're not caring about the longevity longevity and the health of the of the divisions. They're just kind of like, let's do what we could do now to kind of get the most bang for a buck. And the fact that all the divisions are pretty fucked. And, you know, when you heard Dana before at the press conference talking like, yeah, Dana, I mean, um, yeah, DC could go up. If if Kane's the problem, he could go fight Stipe and then just vacate the belt later. When have you ever heard about Dana White just talking about the belt like some shit like that? So... Honestly, that also kind of tells me something. What that tells me is that GSP and Dana White most likely had a very good understanding of what was going down. And they also had an understanding of how they have to posture for the public. So it really does not surprise me if they're willing to do a one-off super fight with DC and Stipe, and that was before, that was when Dana White was speaking hypothetically before he's even made, that really doesn't surprise me that he's willing to, he hit him and GSP had a good understanding. And, you know, with the, especially with Robert Whitaker, who has staff, and his staff is like apparently going to his organ, so that's a problem. And you got Luke and fucking Yoel with the interim title. And Whitaker had the interim title and was just promoted. And, you know, shit, shit, shit is just fucked. And I'm not going to run through it all. I, I, I'm i sure we've run through it at length multiple times. But another thing I wanted to, to talk about and bring up, it's like, Kind of, kind of going along with the whole thing of the the streaking champions and the super fight era, and dude, TJ DJ, amazing fucking fight, super fight to the fullest. I agree with that. Cyborg Nunez, that's really a super fight. Two high level female champions going at it, arguably best in the world. You have Amanda Nunez, she has Misha Tate and Ronda Rousey on her record. You know, um, that's not all, but that's very like. They're are arguably the the greatest women fighters. Um, Cyborg, you know, she's got Gina Carano, Holly Holm now. So that that that's a good fight. And then now you have Steep A D C. And in that video when I talked about it back in November, when I talked about it, it that oh, are they thinking about doing it? I gave my thoughts on the fight and I said it was cool. It's a good fight. I like it. I'm, I'm down with it. I'm pumped on it. And like you go listen to that video. I talk about it in depth. And I'm going to go more in depth about it. But I just want to kind of get this sentiment off real quick. And it's like, bruh. Imagine if John Jones never fucked up. See, D- DC is getting all of... John Jones missed opportunities and deservingly so because DC is seizing the moments and taking the, taking the, the, the opportunities and chances that John Jones was pretty much, it was right at his doorstep and it, it, he's kept fucking it up. However, however many times, however it's happened, it's, it just, he's been fucking up. And now DC has chance to has the chance to make fucking history. 
history to the craziest extent. Like, to kind of be in the same breath of not only the two weight world champions. My bad, I had my pop filter. But not not only in the same breath of the two weight world champions, but a hybrid of Randy Couture and Conor McGregor. Think about that. Daniel D.C. Cormier, if he does this, he's going to be in the conversation of up there with the great, however you want to put it, whether you're, whether you're talking about not, not even saying making the argument of he's the greatest of all time. Not even saying that I'm not even talking about that. I'm saying when you're just speaking on accolades on paper, historically, it's going to say Daniel Cormier, light heavyweight champion. It's not even going to say two time light heavyweight champion. It's just going to say light heavyweight champion. And then you're because the Jones fight was in second one was a no contest, so he never lost the belt. So it's gonna say that he's had it from whatever, say fucking twenty fifteen to now. He still has it. And then he's go so that's like pretty much three years that he's held the belt, and then he's going up in weight class. To challenge the, the no ar, no argument, the longest defending heavyweight, arguably the greatest heavyweight, going up to a weight class he's undefeated in, and then challenging the the arguably greatest heavyweight. You know, so when you when you look at just on and say he does it. Let, let, let's go through the path saying he does it. Then if you take out the, the the longest reigning, arguably greatest heavyweight, you can make the argument that you're the greatest heavyweight now. So then you have, although you have a fighter that's looming that you know that when he whenever these two come into the ring, one man's got the better of the other. But when you're looking at accolades, if DC does this, he's he. he, If DC does this, it it's game changing. You know, if DC accomplishes this, he like, and I heard him talk about talk about this on the MMA Hour. And granted, the way. He was he was talking about it. You could argue that like it was like arrogant and filled with hubris, but it really like it it really had heavy tones of that. But when you really look at it, it's true to an to an extent. And I think it's a lot with it says a lot that I'm saying this because I mean we all know how I feel about DC and shit, but you can't argue with factual inf- information. Especially if he goes out there and beats Stipe. If he beats Stipe, he has to. He has to. It's a requirement for it to happen. He has to look better than he's ever looked, ever. And you know, um, before I go on with that, I kind of want to talk about uh, a point real quick. When John Jones was returning and he was facing DC, um, and the kind of talks about going up and challenging Stipe, he was kind of like, eh, you know, uh, I don't, I don't eh, we need time, you know, blah, blah, blah. He was, it kind of seemed like he was a little backtracking a bit. Because at first, when, if you guys really remember, when, um, when Kane, I, I believe this was the the timeline. When Fabricio and Kane were meant to fight, um, Kane fell off, and then Stipe came up, and then Fabricio pulled out, and then Stipe needed an opponent uh, needed an opponent, and then John Jones was actually willing. He was down to fight Stipe at that time. And he said, the only thing is, I'm not going to fight for an interim belt. 
And keep in mind, this would have been his return before the OSP fight. So it would have been John Jones returning to fight Stipe for the interim belt at that time because Fabricio was still the champ. So he was like, I'd be down to fight Stipe, but I'm, I'm not fighting for an interim belt. And at that time, there was really no real ground. You can't strip Fabricio from pulling out for one fight. You know what I mean? Like, that's fucked up. So at that point, John Jones said he's willing. But when it kind of came like back to his return, and even when Stebe won the belt, John Jones was all like tweeting like, "Oh, you know, Stebe, this guy's looking like good. It's looking like interesting." And when he was like asked about it in interviews, and when he elaborated on it, he was like, "You know, Stebe's like, you know, he he he's not that big of a heavyweight, you know. So he's one of those guys that I could see myself like going in there and competing with." And then when it came to, like, 214 time and when it was time for him to face DC and and all that stuff, he was like, uh, you know, Stipe is a little bigger and da 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 My team and I would need to talk about a game plan. And it was a lot of kind of back- backtracking. And I was like, er, Shraggy? Like, what do you... I- <laughs> Why, what happened to that same energy you were keeping? Like, you're not keeping that. Like, yeah, you are talking before. And to see, to see DC just come in the wing and for him to be like, you know, that's something I would like to do. But the fact is, my boy, like, you know, you guys know I left the division because of my guy. And I want my guy to get the belt. I'm not trying to stand in the way of that. But when it came to a point where they're like, all right, we could arrange a way for you to get the belt and you not stand in the way of your guy getting the belt later. He grabbed that shit up. And that that speaks a lot to his character, because when you look at it's it's not the same, but it's kind of in the same vein of Mighty Mouse and DJ. I mean, I'm fucking Mind Mouse and TJ Dillashaw because TJ is doing his damn motherfucking thing right now at Bantamweight and DJ is doing his thing to an extent, but it's getting stagnant and, you know, you could essentially, you you could really have, um, like, you could have an ally Kinta and give create like a a one fifty seven pound division for him, and then just have him face guys from the LFA, and I'm, and I'm not I'm not trying to disrespect the the featherweight di- division I mean the flyweight division to that extent, but I'm saying when you get guys that are green, especially at the level that Demetrius Johnson is when he's facing. Guys like Ray Borg and shit like that, especially at this this point in his title defenses, it's 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 really like it's not making a lot for your statement when you're talking about legacy. But when you look at a guy like TJ Dillashaw, who he he's been facing, you know, coming up, had his his uh his kind of moment with Henan Burrell, who was at that time poised as that guy. And then he had a close split decision loss to Dom and then fought Rafael Asuncao, who he lost the split decision to avenge that loss. And then he went, fought a guy in John Lineker, who's tough as fuck, executed a perfect game plan and dismantled him. After that, you look at, and then I think, I think it was the Cody fight. So he was facing top contenders and then came back and then even in the Cody fight faced adversity, arguably got saved by the bell. But, um, you know, um, we're not even going to go there. But he, although he got rocked so hard, he came back and then fucking rock Cody once and then knocked him out pretty much. And then you look at his stance now and what he's done being a two time band and weight champion it actually puts a legacy on his, like, like a stamp on his legacy. I've talked about this before, how, like, TJ, um, TJ really 
made a point that he got the real belt because, you know, Cody was kind of talking that shit and it was kind of arguably true. He's like, yeah, when you fought Dom for the argu- for the pretty much unification bout, you lost it. I got my belt off Dom. But then TJ got that belt off Cody, so now he's back. And when you look at it, I'm going to do a video on this. You know, I talk a lot about lineal belts. The only divisions that have linear belts the only champions that have linear belt, it, re, in reality, is TJ Dillashaw and motherfucking uh, Mighty Mouse. And, and there's other people like Amanda Nunes and shit like that. But in, in the history of the other divisions, it's really not there. And you can kind of make the argument, oh, because... Um, with, with TJ and the bantamweight division because Dom got stripped, but Dom came back and it was like back in a play and shit like that. So, and, and Dom came back to essentially get reclaim the belt. So it was like the champion was back. So, you know, with the interim belt and all that. And then he faced the uh, alleged, you know, not really calling TJ interim champ, but kind of TJ got his belt off of a promoted interim champ. So when we're talking about the, 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 the linear, lineage of the belt and i'm just kind of rambling right now about that shit but i don't, I don't even fucking remember where the fuck i was going with that shit anyway high level shit good fight oh i kind of do remember I, I was drawing a point with someone who the fuck was i talking about um high ramblings <laughs> um dc i think yes yeah, because I always draw on the parallel to DC how how he could um about legacy and all that shit going up and like made the Stanford his legacy and how you know um DJ was hesitant to do that at that moment, but I, I was making a larger point, but I forgot about it, so I'm just gonna get away from it. Back to DC and Stipe, fucking to to my thoughts on that fight, man, like. It's legit as fuck, and I think it's also kind of telling that, you know, we're having rumors that, oh, John Jones coming back soon, Dana White is projecting John Jones is coming back this year, and when you look at them making a plan of making a fight in the middle of the year in July on, on their biggest card... And the fact that they're doing a tough building up to it says one of two things. John Jones isn't coming back and they're just kind of moving on and making the biggest moves they can make without him. And, you know, like making the moves they would make as if he was there with DC. So because DC is the champ, you know what I mean? So when you when you look at that, it's like, all right, are they? Are they moving on, or is it also kind of being used as a setup for John Jones' return? But that's definitely saying that John Jones isn't. If he's coming back this year, he's definitely not coming back to the like third quarter, fourth, fourth quarter, second half of the fucking year. So it's like, oh, and that's if he's coming back, man. And I'm not even sure if he's coming back this year. Like, what's going down with it? They were trying to say shit like, oh, like shit's coming back soon, but that not now. I, I don't know. I feel like with them making this big of a move with DC Stipe, although it doesn't derail any plans with John if he were to return, kind of seems like they're saying, you know what, like, like we're gonna stick to Dana White's motto that the the promotion moves on without you. Like the stars don't make the promotion, quote unquote. We make the stars. So they're like, all right, we're going to put DC on in a star place making performance. We're going to put him in that place. And, you know, putting putting DC in the situation, giving him these accolades. And if he achieves it, just how how decorated he would be. It's like. Minus John, all John Jones bullshit, like. If, if, if say John Jones never fucked up and he's just been going, and he was or, or or he came back didn't fuck up again after two fourteen and then did this, 
if he were to beat Stipe, that'd be a stamp on him being the GOAT. No no doubt about it. Because he'd be that only true, line, like, you know, streaking champion of the Golden Age still today. But he's not there. And he's not there for it. And he he's not there to be able to do anything about it. I don't even think he's spoken about it. I haven't seen him saying anything about it. And... I like it's I, I'm ha- like honestly bro like John is my guy. I fuck with John. We all know that like how I feel about John, how he's like one of my favorite fighters and all that, but I'm happy for DC cuz All right, DC could have fought Gus over Vulcan. Not gonna lie. Division was light. <laughs> Gus had a better victory, you know, although it wasn't as recent, but a win in that fashion, how he looked over Glover to Shara is weighted more heavier, in my opinion, than two knockout wins of Misha Serkinoff and Jimmy Manawa. Especially putting into factor that if John wasn't going to go up in heavyweight when he beat DC, Gus was next. Also taking into factor the fight that Gus and DC had and how close it was, they should have ran that shit right the fuck back. Not to mention the fact of how close Gus and John Jones was. Not to mention the fact that DC, when DC got his first fight with John Jones the first time, the first time they were scheduled to fight was because Gus had to pull out because John Jones and Gustafson were slated for their rematch. So I don't, you know, I, I could see the argument for Vulcan and I, I was kind of down with that, but I don't really see that like a fucking poll on Twitter kind of dictating what's happening and a contract being signed and all that. Like, I, I was down with it when it happened. I was down with the matchup and stuff like that. But you can't argue Gus has a, a strong call to the title and a strong argument for a title shot. But, and you could argue that it should have been Gus instead of Vulcan. But not even looking into all that. I'm not trying to second guess anything or say, oh, they should have did this or that. I'm just objectively looking at all sides because when you're looking at the division, you have to, You can, although it's light, you can't ignore the fact that Gustafson has um, a fucking a pretty heavy, heavy calling to the title shot. You know what I'm saying? So. That's that, and and I definitely had to incorporate that in there. But man, DC, bro, he he's making moves and he's taking opportunities, um, and taking chances. He's proven he's not scared. He's proving that he actually really does have the self belief that he could beat DC, and really, essentially, kind of. Honestly, deep down, I to feel like he really could be the heavyweight champion if it wasn't for Kane, if he's really taking this opportunity against this guy. And by this guy, I'm talking about Stipe Miocic. Because Stipe is arguably the greatest heavyweight. Like, let's not, let's not front on that. And with the hype around Francis, and granted, the thing is, the expose at 220... Which is what I want to call it. The expose. It's like. That. That was what we were wondering. Was going to happen with Overeem. Overeem was that litmus test. That Alright. You're either all hype. Or you're ready for the. The highest level. What he did with Overeem. Proved like. Alright. He passed the litmus test. But when it came to Stipe, he's like, all right, granted he passed that test, but 
Let, let, let me give him a quick pop quiz on this. Boom, double leg. All right, man. My bad you failed the semester. You're out of here. Exposed them. And DC, DC is strong in that point. And the fact is, when you look at heavyweight DC, Bigfoot, Josh Barnett, all that shit, Roy Nelson. Granted, Frank Mir wasn't that entertaining. But he 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 did it, and he he was looking good at heavyweight, and you know he, he's done things to he's faced a lot of high level guys, man. Dan Henderson. Regardless, uh, you know I'm not gonna say regardless. Although he looked the way he looked, to quote Daniel himself, when he's talking about John like being on steroids, that's why you looked the way you looked. Uh, um, although he looked the way he looked at Anderson Silva fight, he does have him on his resume. You know what I mean? And going back to the argument on paper, DC really has a, a, a fairly strong resume, man. I, you can't even front on it. And if he beats Stipe, it's more than a cherry to... The it's more than a cherry on top, bro. That's like fucking thirty-two more scoops, and then like drench that shit in some syrup, and then drop like a bunch of Marciano cherries, and then pour that Marciano syrup on there. You know what I mean? Like he, that's like this opportunity is gigantic, bro. You can't front on it. But, you know, we'll see, man. Um, early predictions, and this is very early. I have Stipe winning that. And the reason I have Stipe winning that is because I feel that Stipe's boxing is really crisp. And when Daniel creates distance, when people are pressuring in on him and coming forward... He kind of keeps his hands out and, like, just moves his neck back and moves laterally back. And he doesn't move his head off the center line. He just moves it back, like, further back on the center line and moves laterally backwards. So, Stipe is way too precise, and I feel like he could definitely catch DC like that. I'm not even going to front. That's my that's my early thoughts on it, man. And um, yeah, kind of just shifting gears, getting off the whole super fight shit. You had Jacare Brunson happen this weekend, and I feel like Brunson, dude, he's just like he's that Russian roulette kamikaze fighter hybrid. He's either going to. He, he, he's either going to get you or he's going to get got. <laughs> That's really as simple as I could put it, man. Like, he's either going to knock you out or you're going to knock him out in the process of him trying to come for you. That's just what it is. That's how his game is. That's how... I don't want to use po- the word poor, but I have to in this case. That's how poor his technique is. When you have um, something as fundamental as having your chin held high when you're throwing combinations and that's gotten you in trouble and it's been addressed, but and the fact that it has to have been addressed because it's happened so much and the fact that it's not changing and it's a persistent problem not only is it a persistent problem, it's um, it's something that is derailing you because every time he builds hype, he just knocks that shit right back down in a pretty bad fashion. You know, he, he got that win over Uriah and then, you know, he got fucked up by Whitaker in an embarrassing way. And that's just his shit, you know, he just gets knocked out in crazy ways. And although he has a lot of potential, I just see him 
he can't cross over into that top tier. He can't cross over into that top five. He cannot. He's not going to beat Chris. He's not going to beat Kelvin. He's not going to beat Jacare. We know that for a fact. He's not going to beat Yoel. He's not going to beat Luke. We know he's not going to beat Whitaker. So where does he go? He's a gatekeeper at this point. He He's a guy that you're going to give um, uh, uh, Boracinha to. You know what I mean? That Paolo Costa. That's, that's who he's going to be. He's going to be the launching pad for these people like outside the top 15 uh, on the brink of being on the top 15 once they kind of get get their way in or giving them big chances he's going to be that guy cuz he has he has wins against notable enough people but he can't get to that higher level and that's going to be a shit man he he's going to be gatekeeper brunson my guy looking like a croc. I know he fought Jacare, but Brunson has the face of a fucking alligator or a crocodile. Something about him looks like a motherfucking crocodile. But um, yeah. What else was on there, man? Uh, you had like Feely Bermudez. I don't know it was very weak for a Fox card. Usually they save their um their machine people for the Fox cards. And what I mean by that is they're like, who can we put that is our most marketable fighters and we'll have the most mainstream appeal and just have a card full of them, i.e. the Sacramento card, where it was Paige Van Zandt versus Michelle Watterson, Mickey Gall versus Sage Northcutt, Alan Joban versus Mike Perry, and <laughs> just like... You could have had like a little Reebok fashion show after that. So, you know, for them to have like Jacques Ray Brunson, for it to look like um, a undercard for a, a kind of weak pay-per-view, like that kind of, that looked like the FS1 card for uh, like that Amanda Nunez, Valentina Shevchenko pay-per-view. You know, so to bring that level at Fox, I don't know if it's telling about renegotiations and that aspect of shit, but I just feel like it's just not a Fox product, you know, because although whatever you may be doing when it comes to business and renegotiation and stuff like that, if you're kind of messing up opportunities to grow the company, that kind of that that'd be weak. You know what I mean? Cuz I had I had um a, a friend a while ago who he didn't watch like that much MMA, but he was like um he caught a couple fights and then I think he was like trying to see like Anderson Silva uh Chris Weidman too. And when he saw it, like he was like pumped for, for it to happen and then like when he saw it, he just like kind of wasn't about it. And then the next time I was like, oh, bro, you want to watch, like, you want to come over and watch the fights? He was like, ah, like, nah, like, I, I, I'm good on it, man. You know what I mean? So you have these moments where you have people that say, say your, your regular demographic, your key demographic is like, like from 18 to 35. So... When you when you have that take take like your mainstream younger like your you like say from like like my age from like from like twenty four to eighteen down like say that or from like twenty four to to fucking um like seventeen sixteen you have that kind of like younger end of the tier say the ones that don't watch martial arts or MMA or anything like that, their kind of fight exposure is world star YouTube street fights, shit like that coming up on like that Kimbo slice shit. And when they, when they see, Oh shit, like the fights are on, like they, they're just browsing around on like Fox on a Sunday or some shit. They're, they're trying to watch family guy, but they're like, Oh, some fights are on. And then they watch and they see these two motherfuckers on the ground one guy's got his leg wrapped around another guy 
And he, the other guy's got his head just lying on the other dude's chest. And the other guy's just kind of holding him close to the other guy. And they're just kind of pitter-pattering. And they, they don't know about jujitsu. They don't know about guard. They don't know about control. They don't know. They don't know about you know, you know, sweeps. They don't know about any about that. Any anything like that. All they see is what they can understand from visually the basics of what they're seeing. They're like, yo, this is kind of whack. Especially when they're going from like wild haymaker world star shit. So I'm not saying you got to put it on like fight of the nights on every shit, but you got to have like high level shit to an extent that the matchups are going to be entertaining. You know, they have the ability to do it. You got to make sure, especially those big Fox cards, you do that. And they really dropped the ball on that. The kind of, the main event was really the only thing that really came through with it. And, you know, um, it it was an all right card at that other thing. Um, What else is fucking going on, bro? Um, Oh yeah, Cynthia Calvillo. Got popped for weed, and that's not like not that big of a deal. So who really gives a fuck? Oh, there's a rumor that Vasily Lomachenko is drilling wrestling, and he's teasing moving to MMA. That'd be fucking dope as fuck. I'd be all about that. Um, a uh, little boxing talk. Triple G versus Canelo two is on. That's already confirmed, so that, um, that's all I'm say. I'm gonna say about that right now. And then Ronda Rousey is in the WWE, making the most cringeworthy fucking appearance. Per like, <sighs> talk about awkward. Talk about awkward. Talk about low self esteem. Talk about being broken and obviously just being duct taped up at the moment. Talk about a desperation move. And I'm saying that because the fact of not saying, oh, she should fight. this, She's going to that fake shit and all that, which is true. But it's like just the way she, she looked. And to quote TC again, she looked the way she looked. Um, it was awkward and she looked uncomfortable and that's I don't know that aura about her is completely just gone even like on some fake shit like even on some scripted shit like we're gonna make you the baddest woman in the world because we can get we can control the outcome and even knowing that like she can't go in there and just have that like that oomph about her that like star power that although she wasn't like that eloquent and well spoken and like this like charismatic person when she was at her peak she had that the 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 fashion she was winning her fights in she kind of had that that shit about her where they would talk about her fighting floyd (laughs) so you know what i mean so she kind of had like that about her now that 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 shit is gone it's kind of like ugh and even I saw like a ESPN interview afterwards and it was just mad awkward and she kept laughing and giggling and like was just like really, really socially awkward and gave a terrible interview, a fucking terrible interview. And I was like, whoa, like what the fuck happened to Rhonda, man? Like, damn, like you could at least like try and like, act like, Put out, put on a little more of an act, you know. Like, it kind of looks like readjusting to being in front of the cameras. It's gonna take a little time for her if she even does, you know. Um, this is a completely lateral <sighs> move that isn't good for the sport in whole. And I'll tell you why, man. When you look at the biggest pay-per-view names, you got Ronda Rousey, Brock Lesnar, Conor McGregor, and yes, Nate Diaz. Um, when you look at two of them, you know what? For argument's sake, I'm gonna take Nate 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 out of this for uh to to highlight my argument. So you have Ronda 
Connor, and Brock. When you have Ronda and Brock, two-thirds of your largest stars are in WWE. So when you look at the outer rim of fandom and the mainstream, WWE and MMA are heavily integrated to them because Ronda Rousey, oh, she's in WWE. Brock Lesnar, he's in WWE. Oh, they were both UFC champions. So what it what is it? Like they the WWE just like goes over and fights for real there when they want in the UFC or is it like you know, they they don't really know what the fuck is good with the sport. So just like blurring the lines to this extent overall for the sport is a fucked up look and I'm not about it. But I guess she has to sustain um, a lifestyle and capitalize on whatever momentum is remaining and try and grow a career out of that. So I don't blame her for that. I just think it's a whack look for MMA overall to have pro wrestling that heavily integrated with the heaviest names and the the heaviest hitters and the biggest names of our sport you know granted Brock was there and he's a crossover but it was kind of like um Ronda and Connor not like I although she had like a brief appearance in there it, it wasn't like a thing you know what I mean even Floyd had like a moment WWE um but it was now that she's like a part a part of it it's just you know I made my point on it it's not a good look but, you know, uh, Cody Garbrandt said he'd be down with a rematch with Dom. Dom said he'd be down with a rematch with Cody, you know. So I think that's a good fight. I, I definitely want to see that. It has to be a five-rounder. You cannot make that a three-round uh, fight, although it's in the non-title fight. You absolutely have to make that the main event of something for it to be five rounds. And... um I feel winner of that uh, gets the the winner the next shot at TJ when he comes back from fighting Mighty Mouse. Um, winner of the Dom Cody rematch when get gets TJ and I feel like um, Jimmy Rivera is kind of sitting on his ass a little too much. And you know I, I get shit didn't work out and stuff like that, but to kind of just sit idle for no reason when you're kind of really supposed to be like making a, a big statement for a title shot because I mean he he did get clipped up a bit in his Almeida fight and although I like Jimmy and then he he is extremely high caliber he doesn't have a stronger statement than Dominic Cruz or Cody Garbrandt Dominic Cruz is the most you know arguably the greatest bantamweight and he already has a win over the current champion Cody Garbrandt has argument because he beat Dom and then he had TJ Hurt in the first round. So when you look at those two sides of things, there's no argument that Jimmy Rivera is more deserving than those two. And I feel like Dom and Cody both have good enough arguments where it's like, all right, you two hash it out and the winner of that gets the title shot. So that's my thoughts on that. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So... Dana White, I didn't, I got to, I didn't get to talk about this. Dana White was being like really fucking. I know in my last podcast episode, I, I labeled it, um, Ferguson versus Khabib, um, uh, McGregor strip. That was, that was like when, um, before Ferguson and Khabib was official, official, but it was pretty much official, you know. So I figured they were gonna strip Connor and then do all that, but the way Dana was acting at that press conference, it was on some weirdo shit, and it's like, bro, like, how is it for the real belt, but you're not stripping the undisputed champion and you're not promoting the interim champion, yet you're saying with the undisputed champion existing and the interim champion fighting the number one contender that it's going to be for the undisputed title, but no one's getting stripped or promoted in this moment. So what sense does that fucking make? None. So I don't know what they're doing with that. I don't know what's going on with that. Um, yeah, man. So like that that's some weird shit, man. I don't know why they're, they're going about it in that way, but... um. 
it is what it is at this point, man. So fuck that. But I'm definitely going to that fight. Um, and they got the Gros and JJ too. So I'm pumped for that fight. Um, I'm definitely pumped on that. So yeah, we had Paige Van Zandt getting engaged in that. So I don't know who really gives a fuck. Uh, yeah, bro. I I think I talked about a lot about what I wanted to talk about. Um, super fight era, man. Like, like how Holloway says it's the blessed era. It's the super fight era. I'm pumped for Frankie Max too. So I I can't wait till they get that on, bro. Um, yeah, man. Lots going on. MMA world is looking good. I kind of like the way they're moving. I mean, although they're, the divisions are fucked up, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm not going to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I'm going to look at the good. I'm going to look at, we're getting dope fights. We're getting cool fights. We're getting marquee value fights because you have two belts on the line. And if you were to just, if they were to make that card and you look at a poster and when you see every fighter on that poster, when you have six of them and every one of them have a belt on their shoulder, that's on some extremely dope shit i'm about it you know so you know they could keep doing this if they find a happy medium of keeping the integrity of the divisions while still incorporating super fights the sport's gonna blow the fuck up bigger than it is you know what i mean so that's my thoughts man thanks for listening and i appreciate you guys always you already know it's mastermind mma